And I would like to say, A, that in case of any, any of you are not yet familiar with the organizations that were represented by our panelists now, it's worth checking out all of them. So whether it's EFF, CIS, Hibber, Sastone, or the Power 254 space, um, they're all worth organizations looking up and following. So I encourage you to do that if you don't yet know them. And the last uh, question raised was actually the perfect transition debate about post-privacy or even pre-privacy, I think will be picked up by the next session. And I would just like to pass the mic now to Christian, who is the host of the next session. Thank you so much, Geraldine. And I'm going to accompany our wonderful keynote speaker now to the stage. Please, Brian, after you. Yeah, I'm going to do an introduction, don't worry. Please be so kind. He, she, IT. Who are we without privacy? Is the title of our next session. And as well, the title of our keynote, which precedes our talk. And I would love to introduce our honored guest, Priya Basile. Priya is a British author, born in London. And, uh, ah, I see there's a little bit of commotion in the back, please. Thank you. Is a British author, born in London. And she has uh, published so far two novels, Ishk and Mushk and the obscure logic of the heart. At this point, she lives in Berlin already for quite a while. She's blogging for The Guardian uh, on surveillance matters uh, and German government policies and involved in Authors for Peace, one initiative, and just preparing a new in initiative with the likes of Ilya Trojanov and Yuri C. That should be fine for an introduction. Priya, please. Thank you, Christian, and hello to everyone. I'm, it's a pleasure to be able to join you all for this important discussion today. Uh, I couldn't help noticing while I was sitting at the back there the little slogan on the wall here that nature will unveil our personalities, it says in German. And I couldn't help thinking the irony of that, knowing what we know about how else our personalities are being unveiled. So, we read to know that we are not alone wrote William Nicholson, a British author. Reading has long been one of the most private and solitary activities. You do it on your own, and yet through it, you are connected to the world. Nicholson was no doubt referring to the extraordinary power of books, above all fiction, to take us out of and far beyond ourselves, while at the same time illuminating our innermost thoughts and emotions. I guess he didn't consider that e-books would pop along, and make clear that we're not alone in a rather different way. 172 other people also highlighted this, my Kindle informed me, the first time I electronically underlined a sentence. I immediately opted out of the po um, device's popular highlights tool. So my favorite quotes are no longer included in the public tally of passages that are meaningful to the most number of people, as Am Amazon puts it but they are still logged somewhere in the vast annals of the company's data collection servers, just as they record the time whenever I turn the Kindle on or off, whatever I read, whichever point in a book I stop reading. Before Snowden's revelations, I was aware of this and disliked it, but it didn't especially perturb me. Now, knowing the extent to which our data has been collected and stored, I'm more reluctant to use an e-book, because to do so is to accept an intrusion on the precious intimacy of reading. The moment you purchase a book on Amazon, you're given the option to tell everyone what you just bought through social media. As you highlight a sentence, you're reminded that you can share it with the wider world. And when you finish, you're prompted once again to declare the fact publicly through Facebook or Twitter. All this means that the space in which you're allowed to have your own quiet train of thought shrinks. Remember Rousseau's famous words? Man is born free, but everywhere he is in chains. We are surely in chains when we cannot even read without being advertised to and being encouraged to advertise ourselves. For me, reading is an essential part of writing. I don't think I could write if I didn't read. Reading feeds my imagination, my sensibility, my language, 
And all this has thus far happened in a mysterious and almost untraceable way. Sure, I've jotted quotes into notebooks, sometimes even typed up whole passages that I've loved. But the process of inspiration and understanding was mine alone. Now, traces of all the reading and researching I do electronically can be vacuumed up into some huge database. I'm complicit in this because I'm seduced by the convenience of apps like Evernote, which allow me to catalog notes and therefore find things much more easily than when they were spread out between dozens of different notebooks. In fact, I'm so tempted by the internet that I, like many writers, have paid to download a program called Freedom, which can block me from using the net so that I can actually concentrate for long enough to write. <laughs> Our digital existences are altering who we are and how we behave. We are no longer just she or he. We are also IT, which fittingly contains both a reference to the self, I, and stands for information technology. The letters I and T also denote it, what we define as a non-human entity, and what we become when our data is indiscriminately collected, used, and stored by states and corporations as though it were public property and not very personal information. It, in this context, also echoes Freud's id. In German, the connection is even more striking because the word for both it and id is exactly the same, s. According to Freud, the id, ego, and superego are the three parts of our psychic apparatus. The id, he suggested, is the part without judgment and morality, driven only by the wish for pleasure. Our virtual selves seem to be almost entirely governed by the it pe pleasure principle. We're very active online, yet very passive about the ethical implications of what we do there. You'd hesitate, hopefully, to steal in a physical shop, yet you're probably quite relaxed about illegally downloading books, films, and music without payment. If a stranger on a bus grabbed your mobile phone and started scrolling through the contacts list, noting down names and numbers, you'd challenge the person immediately. If it turned out that a neighbor had been opening your post, you'd call the police. You wouldn't tolerate a random person coming into your house to look at the family photos. Yet when we're told worse things are happening with our information on the internet, we shrug and continue playing with our apps as if there's no alternative. It seems almost schizophrenic to be able to live by such double standards. Perhaps we evade the truth of the situation because we're afraid to confront its implications. But just because we avoid seeing something doesn't mean it isn't there. And it definitely won't go away because we ignore it. What will disappear, if mass surveillance persists, are our hard-won democratic rights and civil liberties. These may be guaranteed by law and upheld by institutions, but to have true meaning, they must reside first and foremost within our own person. Over himself, over his own body and mind, the individual is sovereign. John Stuart Mill put it so elegantly. Yet this sovereignty is being encroached in significant, though almost imperceptible, increments. I talked in some detail about the trespass on reading, but we can now be followed and observed during so many private activities, shopping, holidaying, driving, dating, even sleeping, apps like Sleep Cycle, Trap, track your sleep patterns, record anything you say, and can even measure the levels of your snoring. It's not just you who gets an insight into your nocturnal subconscious activities. All that data is churned into a marketing strategy to sell you sleep aids or something else that will, of course, hugely improve the quality of your sleep and your life. And who knows? Perhaps in future, information about your insomnia could be put to other uses like affecting your job prospects or your medical insurance. Because the data doesn't go away. The internet and its service never forget. To a great extent, we choose to engage with all these online offers, as Professor Vincent mentioned, and we do so with the impression of asserting our own free will. But the maze of surveillance and profiling is now so vast that there's no way to avoid it. And if things are constantly tailored to sway us in a certain direction, most of us incline that way, almost in spite of ourselves. We don't quite become automata, but we're inevitably influenced, even if just subconsciously, 
by the marketing targeting at, targeted at us through the constant surveillance that has become part and parcel of doing things electronically. Snowden's revelations highlighted the extent to which the state can now spy on its citizens, but as many of you speaking already have acknowledged, corporations have been at it for a while. The unholy alliance between the two threatens the very foundations of our society. Data collection relating to my creative process doesn't trouble me because I'm worried about being accused of plagiarism or because I want to keep my sources and influences secret. It bothers me because an awareness of my own mental and imaginative workings has crept into my consciousness. It's not a good sort of watchfulness, rather a slightly inhibiting one, since it occupies a portion of my thinking that's con consequently taken away from being creative. Moreover, fear is part of this new resident in my mind. After David Cameron suggested that The Guardian should be investigated for reporting on Snowden's leaks, I was enraged. I channeled this into an open letter to the Prime Minister, but once it was written, I felt anxious about posting it online. I had taken umbrage at Cameron's remark that The Guardian's reporting is dangerous for national security. On the contrary, I wrote, your unwillingness to engage in an honest debate about mass surveillance is far more dangerous for the country than anything else. Security is not just about being safe from terrorists. Security is most fundamentally freedom from fear. And nothing is more frightening than a state that can indiscriminately spy on its citizens. The truth, I went on, is that you risk abetting terrorism by not addressing the urgent and vital concerns about the way GCHQ operates. Mass surveillance undermines the de democratic foundations of our society, which is exactly what terrorists want to do. Moreover, by ignoring the demands of the public for more online regulation and transparency, transparency you foster dissent and unrest. Revolutions are born from disregard of the public will and the common good. It's provocative, certainly, but not really that controversial. At least it shouldn't be in a country where freedom of speech really exists. Still, I had to force myself to publish it, knowing that the act of doing so was more important for my own integrity than anything else. I'm not the only one experiencing such ambivalence. A recent Penn survey of writers in the US found that in the wake of Snowden's revelations, one author in six avoided writing on certain topics which they thought might subject them to surveillance, and a further one in six considered it. One writer admitted, I have felt that even to mention the Snowden case in an email would flag my email as being worthy of looked at. While another said, even taking this survey makes me feel somewhat nervous. I recently changed my search engine from Google to Start Page, and initially I was mildly irritated that it didn't anticipate what I wanted to find, the way Google does, as I typed in the first letters. I had to enter the full description of what I wanted to do the search. What a hassle, pressing those extra keys. It took a few attempts to become accustomed to Start Page and appreciate the knowledge that it doesn't predict what I might be looking for because it doesn't record what I and others looked for previously. Many people like me relish some of the highly tailored services offered by online companies, even as we despise the fact that it is achieved through mass surveillance of our activity by the companies whose services we use. The Polish sociologist Sigmund Bauman puts a disturbing spin on our resignation in the face of such surveillance, suggesting that we actually crave it. The condition of being watched and seen, he says, has been reclassified from a menace into a temptation. He suggests we are seduced by the promise of enhanced visibility, the proof of social recognition. And he goes so far as to rephrase Descartes' famous cogito ego sum to read, I am seen, watched, noted, recorded, therefore I am. As I said before, the knowledge of being observed alters how we are. In some sense, we are most ourselves, most free, when we are alone and unobservable. The boundless scope of the internet suggests complete freedom, but it's actually more of a free for all, encouraging a reckless show and tell culture at the expense of the individual. If the product is free, you are the product, 
as Nicolas Fargo, head of the Belgian, data, uh, the Belgian um, Centre for Data Protection said, to be truly free, we need to have boundaries, privacy and secrets. It's what no one knows about you that allows you to know yourself, as Don DeLillo intriguingly put it. Awareness of surveillance is already making some writers change the way they work. In the novel I'm currently writing, I have a bit about forward intelligence teams in the UK, FIT teams as they're called. They're basically a special police force that shows up at protests and rallies and keeps an eye on activists. They take photos of act activists and keep notes on them even if they have no criminal record and have done nothing wrong. In the past, I researched about FIT teams online without a thought. Now I do it, but with some anxiety in the back of my mind that simply entering these terms into a search engine might make me a target to be watched. The Penn US survey indicates that other writers are also now wary of researching online for sensitive subjects like drug wars, mass incarceration, child abuse, or pornography. When self-consciousness turns into self-censorship, something is very wrong. Such wariness is more typical in totalitarian regimes. It's shocking to find it in democracies where our civil liberties are still supposedly intact. In totalitarian states, citizens used to have three choices, inner migration, resistance, or exile. The inward migration was a retreat into the self, an attempt to live without challenging the status quo in the hope that one would remain unnoticed and therefore left alone. Resistance involved challenging the prevailing order, taking risks even with one's life. And exile, of course, was emigration, leaving for somewhere more free. Today, exile is no longer an option. The new international order means that we can be followed or observed wherever we go. Even being offline can no longer protect us. Indeed, a retreat from technology would be more an inner migration than a form of exile. Right now, we really have only two choices, to shut up or speak up. And if you keep stum, you're agreeing to become a commodity, a slavish data mine which states and companies can excavate for their own profit. So actually, there's really only one choice, to speak up and demand that our democratic rights apply equally in virtual as in real space. And in the meantime, to take any action, however small, even if it's just switching search engine, that limits the intrusions on our privacy and freedom. In Civilization and Its Discontents, Freud stated, most people do not really want freedom because freedom involves responsibility and most people are frightened of responsibility. Not to take responsibility now, knowing the extent and consequence of mass surveillance is to resign the copyright and sovereignty over your own identity. If you're ready to do this, then the question only rings out more loud and shrill than ever. Who are you, he, she, or IT? Priya, thank you so much for your input. Um, now I'd like to call our two fellow uh, panelists to the stage, which is uh, Marina Weisband, please Marina, and Clemens Kaspar-Mirau. Maybe Priya, if you would like to, to come in. Yes. So, for those of us who shouldn't know, uh, I shortly introduce who's sitting with us now. Here is uh, Marina Weisband, a former, one could say in English, probably general manager Political of the Pirate director. Party. Political director of the Pirate Party, thank you very much. And author of the book, uh, We Call It Politic. And next to Marina is Clemens Kaspar-Mirau. Um, 
you find him in the internet under lightmedium.de. He has engaged himself in the digital sphere for many years, also at some of the Spagaria conferences, and he is responsible for the quite interesting blog Popcorn Pirates. De, which some of you might know as well. Thank you very much for being here. So before I start out with the first round of questions, I would like to show a very short clip, one minute, uh, which gave the title to our conference and shows a little, let's say, example of invasion of privacy from the cultural world of the TV series. Please, Rene, roll the tape. Anything on the riverfront, Esplanade Project in Newark? My guy in the state assembly, he says the matching funds are this close. The development agency, they added plans for a city of Newark museum of science and trucking. Or cement. Or everything. Mm -hmm. Answer the fucking thing. So, you feeling okay? Oh, you mean about my mother? Well, I mean, what are you gonna do? You pick up the pieces and you go on. I meant your spells. They're not spells. How do you know about that the fuck over there in New York? Everybody knows. There's nothing to be ashamed of, Tony. For Christ's sake, Julius Caesar was an epileptic. Not an epileptic. Whatever it is, you gotta take care of yourself. It's your health. Is the psychiatrist helping? Oh, you know about that too. So what? There's no stigmata these days. My kid saw a shrink. He got court order for that thing with his wife. They're very happy now. What ever happened to privacy? Our family's been doing our Jay-Z business a long time with the Sopranos, in a peaceful and profitable way. And I want to keep it like that. Take care of this for me, okay? All right, come on. Why fuck around? Be a better friend to yourself. I will. I appreciate your concern, really. Thank you, Renee. Any yes. So, this... The Sopranos, which most of you might know. So we have just this little example of even that a mob boss feels his privacy invaded, yes? And I think even a mob boss has probably the right being used to surveillance in his professional life, yes? To have a little bit of privacy in his private life. Um, I would connect this maybe to the first round uh, of questions to all of you. Um, six months ago, when the Snowden revelations came out, uh, Byung Chul Han um, uh, published a little essay in the Tagesspiegel called We Are All Agents. Um, his thesis was that basically by overexposure and by delivering data voluntarily, uh, that not only, let's say, the NSA, the watchdog, or the watchman in the Bentham Panopticum is guilty of the situation as we find ourselves in now, but also our deliverance of data voluntarily. Is that a thesis you would share? Maybe we start out with Marina, if you like. Um, I wouldn't necessarily share that because there's a huge difference in um, being observed by um, an agency that is connected to a state that has the monopoly of power and um, being observed by or googled by individuals because they nor companies can kick in your door and um, put you into prison but the state can so that there's a huge difference and I you know there's certain positive aspects of sharing data um, big data can have positive aspects for uh, science, medicine, um, your personal life too. Um, the question is what are we doing with the data and where is it going and is it connected? I don't see the sharing of the data as a problem. I see um, a problem when it's done not consciously. So if I don't understand what I'm sharing and what can happen to it, that's a problem and if it's connected from different sources, as long as it's decentral, as long as it's not used, um, it would be okay. The problem is we can connect it, so we will connect it. Clement? Um, I, I would um, 
agree on, on um, Marina's thesis um, about the, the difference between the, uh, the state as a powerful actor and um, personal actors that are doing things. But what I would disagree with is the um, uh, discussion about uh, the uh, consciousness about um, knowing what you are doing. So uh, I, I think Priya had an example of a sleeping timer app where you kind of track your, your sleeping behavior. There's a very simple uh, example that uh, shows that you don't even need that. There's a web, t there's a web page, I think it's called uh, um, uh, twittersleepingtime.org or something like that. Uh, you can find it by Googling it. And um, what you're doing there is you just enter your Twitter name and it will tell you your sleeping behavior. So it will, it, it's going to tell you when you're going to sleep and it works quite well, at least for me. Um, so um, even without um, kind of being able to, to know that I'm publishing my sleeping pattern, which might be of interest for my health insurance company, um, because I'm sli only sleeping six hours a day, so that, that's uh, not that much. Um, I'm, now, I'm not, now I'm able to, to know that I'm doing it. Actually, I noticed there is no way of not doing it. Um, but there are a lot of other things that we don't know yet about what we publish. I, I would just add to that that I think that um, the I don't think we should the corporation and the power that they have can be left out of um, the equation either. So yes, um, the state has a has a different kind of agency to come into our lives and decide things for us because they know things about us. But the constant surveillance by corporations that we um, are subject to, I think that's a really big question and. I don't think it's that we shouldn't use the internet. Um, for me, it's, it's almost like um, that it's like the sun's rays, you know, they're not all bad. We need the vitamin D for, uh, for, to be healthy and to live, but then we also need sunscreen to protect us from the UVA and UVB rays. There's no screen to protect us on the internet right now. So we need um, laws, we need an in, um, international bill of digital rights that will protect the individual rights. And then this question of what you choose to put there and what can be seen becomes much less threatening because it's clear for all the operators there who can see the information that they can, can or can't use it in a very specific way. Thank you very much. So we speak about responsibility of the individual, but as well of responsibility of politics and the state and of the lawmaking process. Um, let me turn to a, a second issue, which is what kind of strategy can we use ourselves in order to, you know, deal with that new way of cultural communication or culture of communication. And I would raise the point um, that, uh, Clemens, since you were involved also in the, or still involved in the post-privacy ideas and post-privacy movement, um, first of all, does that have a new relevance uh, after the Snowden revelations, number one, and especially maybe to take that one step further for all of you, um, it seems to be like two ways to go, maybe three. Two ways is one, to really go into this surveillance, surveillance, um, let's say, uh, spiral, or let's say another option would be to lose, con to give up control completely. Yes, what would be your way, Clemens? Um, well, re regarding a post-privacy point of view, let me shortly uh, summarize it. So, um, post-privacy, um, from my point of view, is, uh, is not a claim, uh, which is, uh, which often a lot of people think that it's a claim, like uh, you have to expose yourself. So it's not. Um, post-privacy is more, has been a description of what happens and what's going to happen. Um, on the one part and on the other part, there is kind of a utopia, um, um, regarding post-privacy that says if we are going to be public because we, um, we can control it, we have to um, learn to uh, be nice to people, right? So because uh, p people, um, people learn about my personal habits, which I maybe might have prevented to go public um, 10 years ago, 
uh, 10 years ago. Um, but now, um, now I ju just have to face it that people learn about me and um, learn kind of my, my ugly side. Yeah. Um, so this is this is what post privacy is, or what it's what it's trying to to talk about. Um, of course, um, after the uh, NSA revelations of um, of Edward Snowden uh, came up, um, there has been an, um, a discussion about post privacy again. Um, well, the, the first point was that in a way. Um, the post-privacy activists or theorists could say, well, yeah, we, we, we told you about that years ago. It's going to happen and now it happened. So don't blame us for that, right? We told you there's a, lo there's a loss of control and it's not us to blame. We just, we just told you that. Um, but this is not a claim. So it's, we are, um, it's not our claim that, that the state uh, uh, has this mass surveillance. So um, from a post-privacy um, point of view, um, what we'd like uh, to have is the, a transparent state, right, which, uh, which we had uh, uh, um, discussed about today uh, multiple times. So an agency is not post-privacy, right? It's secrecy. Uh, so um, uh, yes, it affects the post-privacy discussion, but it's not what post-privacy is about. Would you agree on this, Marina, or are you, uh, do you have a slightly different opinion? I do have a slightly different opinion. I um, so. <laughs> so I see two sides. Um, either we can like, um, really share data and change society by sharing data, much like the homosexual community did by outing, more, by outing themselves more and more until it just became something normal. Of course, we could try that and just say, we communicate openly and that, that's a utopia, of course. The other thing is unrealistic as well, and that is the continuous fight between surveillance and surveillance. Um, they try to spy on us, we crypt, um, uh, th they get better, we get better. It's a war that is going to continue, and I don't think we're going to win it ever. Um, so the way I think we have to go, um, keeping our privacy, is to change the infrastructure and to change how the infrastructure is governed. And by that, I mean, I'm going to say something that might sound a bit socialist. Um, I'm very far from being socialist, but I think the infrastructure of the internet um, should belong to the people. Uh, by that, I mean, we need uh, an international democratically governed institution that controls the whole infrastructure of the internet. It's just not something that belongs on the free market it's, uh, because it's a basic human right to communicate, much as, like we use the air as a medium for um, communication. Uh, it's the same thing. And to keep it really free from spying, we need to know what's happening in there. We need open software, we need open hardware, and we need to make the rules ourselves. So a super ministry, world ministry of the internet, uh, how, how does it make you feel as an author, Priya? Uh, well, I mean, it's not, it's kind of nice as an idea, but I think it's not, I don't know how practical it is. I, th I think that we have to use the, um, I love the idealism of it, I must say, but uh, I think we have to use what's already there and use that to strengthen what we have. So, you know, we have an amazing um, bill of human rights and we just need to make sure it is actually um, enforced online um, and in the virtual world as it is in the real world. And to that end, we must pressure the UN, we must pressure governments. There has to be a new convention defining our rights um, in the digital world, in this digital age. So basically, you're also proposing to go into the political space and basically fight for that right. I think that's absolutely imperative. I don't really see an alternative because, you know, we are so connected now. It's so much a part of our lives and our worlds. There is so much potential in what the internet um, brings us to. And um, what we rather need to do is protect ourselves as we use it than to think about drawing back from it. Of course, at a personal level, I think there are choices to be made about how much you really want to keep giving away of yourself. But that is very much an individual question. The broader question that we have to, uh, to, to really kind of together as a society decide is what are the laws that govern this 
and, um, and you know, people raise questions of, of freedom and privacy and what that means. And I was quite interested by the Indian uh, thing that came up because actually I think in India it's very easy to bring privacy down to a very personal level. Indians are just naturally quite secretive people. They're always like, oh, no, don't tell. And mm -hmm. they will be really be shameful for the family. And, you know, you don't, they don't have to, he to hear about drones or about, you know, their data being taken to feel that their privacy invaded. You, you just have to say, you know, if you had a phone call with your, sis with your sister about a boy that you met, somebody might hear that and tell your parents and then you know wouldn't that be awful and that that immediately makes people feel oh my goodness that's true that's that's my personal life that's my privacy oh, yeah. thank you very much because that is exactly hitting the point of our next little round how does it and as a personal question to all three of you affect your personal life you told us already something about this prayer but I mean in the sense of do we have to find new or rather old ways of communicating and speaking to each other. Um, I recently read that, for example, the KGB bought typewriters in order not to be, uh, you know, rely on the, on, the, on the net anymore. But if we take it to the, to the personal world, is it not something, are we going back to more person-to-person -person speaking? Yeah. Are we going away a little bit from the, from the digital communication? Is that, let's say, to go on a digital diet, is that, uh, is, is that something, is that a possibility? Does that make sense? Um, well, I'm from the uh, post-privacy kind of movement, so um, what, what I'm personally trying to find out is where my red line is. So um, what, is, what are things that I want to have public or what I don't care about being public? And what are things that I don't want to be um, uh, in the public? I had an um, experience, I, I think it was last year. I have a daughter. She's, she was three years old. And um, I'm taking a lot of pictures with my, with my smartphone. I had an Android phone from, from Google. And all features on. And uh, one of the features is sync every image that you take to uh, Google Plus in a private folder. And uh, one day I, I went to the web page. And what I saw there is a picture of my um, nude daughter online and this was like holy shit right so this is my this is my red line and I noticed um, when I don't want to have those pictures online I just shouldn't take them right so for a parent it's, it's normal just to, to take pictures of your of your daughter and even to take pictures of your nude daughter but you, sh you really shouldn't put them online and so um, this is what I'm trying to find out where's the red line I'm married my, my wife is also quite post privacy in a, in a way, and we uh, communicate via Twitter, even if we are in the same room, and people see how uh, kind of our, uh, our relationship is. And of course, there are, there are things that you have to discuss about. So what, maybe what are things that we don't want to communicate online? And there are things, uh, there are few, but I think that a lot of people just have to, to learn new rules um, because they just changed. My, my father follows me on Twitter and he knows nearly everything about my life and he's telling me I wouldn't ever do this but I really like this, right? So um, I think it's this generation thing and um, I don't claim anybody to do this um, but I think finding out your, your personal rules and telling people you know about this, this is the important thing. Yeah. Um, as Professor Winston so eloquently pointed out, uh, we aren't going back to the typewriter. We aren't taking steps back in technology. That just never happens. Um, what we need to focus on is that we have two different kinds of secrets or concerns towards privacy. And the first kind is our own personal secrets. So dating a boy or pictures of your new daughter. I don't know. It's just things you want to keep for yourself. and you just shouldn't type them into a computer. You never should have, uh, even without the NSA, um, because that's your secrets. You know, when you share them, you share them. And you lose control over everything that is online, even without the NSA. But um, there is another type of um, personal sphere, and that is, for example, your political opinion. Uh, your communication with other people that is social, that is in the open. And I refuse to change my behavior communicating. I refuse to be afraid because that is exactly um, what, what makes the other side win. So um, 
I see a large potential in the internet, uh, especially to, regarding democracy and especially uh, regarding citizen rights, participation and so on. Participation via internet is the next big thing. Um, we shouldn't give that up. We should create an infrastructure, a decentral infrastructure that helps us do so. We should, I agree, um, really uh, argue about the rules that uh, protect us online. Um, I don't think we should do that on a state level because states are, are not an optimal um, infrastructure to design rules for the internet. So what would be the alternative to that? Well, international, first of all, um, maybe on UN level. Um, so it needs to be worldwide, and those rules need to be worldwide, obviously. Um, this, and um, private, decentral networks. Uh, like every citizen can install a router on the roof, and they can communicate with each other, um, which makes uh, a second and a third layer of infrastructure. Um, and that's where we need to go, I think. But I refuse to stop communicating politically because that's self-censorship and it's as bad as censorship from outside. But you said one of the aims of the initiative uh, you are involved now, Priya, to really take this to the UN level? I'm actually not at liberty to say very much about it yet, but okay. in a few days it will, um, yeah, more, more will be revealed. Um, but perhaps another thing, I think, and maybe this is more what Marina had uh, in mind. Uh, do, do you mean, you know, the way we have consumer watchdogs that we can go to when we have, when we buy stuff and there's like problem with it and, and, and the company doesn't deal with us properly. So we have a digital watchdog too. And, but I think that's all part and parcel of a larger um, effort at an international, and I think the UN is the right body for that. Um, but coming back to your question about personal and the, the, the shift, I mean, Please. I mentioned some in my speech, but in the UK, we have really the, a real freebie culture there. So, you know, everywhere you go, every website, it's like, enter your email address and get 10% off your next purchase. Every shop you go into, give us your email address and then we'll, you know, we'll have you on our database. We'll let you know when we have special offers and store cards. And I've always been a real sucker for this free stuff. And uh, recently, I mean, just I think an awareness makes a real difference. Um, suddenly realizing what can happen with the information just makes you think, actually, I'm not going to do that. And I was in London a few weeks ago, and I went to buy, I mean, this is kind of slightly a personal story, but I went to buy a bra, and the lady was fitting me, and she was like, guess what? We've got a special face, uh, offer on Facebook. You go over there, you like us, you post a picture of your favorite bra. And I think she must have seen the horror on my face. And she was like, <laughs> you don't have to be wearing it. You can just post it. And then um, we'll enter you into a competition and you might win 150 pounds to buy a bra from here. And I was like, I was like, that's so horrible. That sounds like the worst offer I could ever imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I think that as people become more aware of what can happen with their information and how absurd some of these kind of offers that are put to us are, we will also resist them more. Thank you. <laughs> what a story. <laughs> Well, I think for the last part uh, of, of this panel, I would like to pass it on to the audience, of course. Um, I think we can uh, go over a couple of minutes of our lunch break, fortunately. So, uh, Geraldine is ready to take some hands. I see Jake over there, for example. I see Paul over here. You go ahead. Ah, Annette, of course, yes. Please, Annette. Well, I think we all agree that we should have a choice. Um, if you want to Twitter with your wife uh, within the same room and tell the world your life, that's your choice. I would like to have the choice not to do it. And I think, I, sorry, I forgot your name, but what you described that the Priya. internet is reading you and that even books are reading you, that is taking away freedom, my freedom. And I want to have a choice that the technology, which I love to use, that it keeps my privacy and therefore my freedom. So I'm, I'm a little disturbed that we do not talk much more about business models. And uh, the Marina, the state intervention you asked for in a way um, should concentrate on business models that are in a way regulated that we still have a choice. 
And I think that is the most important issue in the whole debate. We have to have the chance to buy a book without telling who is buying it and not saying where, which page I'm reading and which page I'm marking, and so on and so on and so on. So I want to have the chance to be in contact and in touch with people, talk with them, write with them, and so on, without telling the world that I'm doing it. And certainly I do not want to give the power to a certain group of people who have economic power and political power because they keep this knowledge. They are a group of people. And I would like you uh, to really um, concentrate of, on this uh, business model and, and intervention. So open standards there. Okay. Freedom of choice. Okay. Should we take that as a statement maybe? And it's a, uh, it's a question to Priya. Well, okay. I, I, I would say that, that um, I mean, I completely agree with you and I feel very much like you do. Um, and I think that from, what, from my understanding of the internet, it's that when we use it, the data is there. There is no way of using it without leaving a data trail. It's just not possible. So, well, um, unless you encrypt, you use Tor, but still there is a kind of trail just that it can't be looked at. So um, I think that um, this notion of an international bill of digital rights, which protects that data so that even it is, if it is there, even if they know what you read, when you read it, what you underlined, it cannot be used by anybody without your permission. And you have the right to go and check, to ask, say, what information of mine do you have, Amazon? Can I see it? And can you delete it? Because I don't want that there anymore. So the, these, these rights have to be spelled out. They have to be made very precise so that the individual feels empowered enough to know what it is the company has and to ask for it to be corrected or deleted if they don't, if, they, if, 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 if I say to Amazon, I don't want you to have the quotes that I underlined anymore. I've since written them down and I want you to delete the record of what you have. They should be able to do that. Right now, they, it, it, I can't do that. So that needs to become possible, that you have agency to ask for what data is there, because it's your data, it's ours, it's not theirs. It's ours, and we have to have the power to control it again. I have, uh, I have two questions, um, short questions, okay. One, first one is to Clemens about the post-privacy uh, movement. Um, the way I understood it was that you do have a claim, and that is uh, to hold, keep the internet as a free space, and that's why you oppose uh, data protection, uh, Datenschutz. And the second um, question is to Marina. Um, doesn't it mean that if we have a worldwide control for the internet, um, that national borders are about to, you know, evade, and that? In the end, what we're facing is a one world state, which has a lot of um, good things, but also, you know, it's really scary that if I can't run away because there are no more borders, nobody's stopping a dictator, you know, putting them back into their boundaries. You know, that's a really scary thought. So if you have, if you have uh, international control over the internet, does that mean that the national state, uh, are you against it? Um, if I, is it on? Hello, hello. Okay. okay. Um, if I un un understood you right, you asked me if the post-privacy movement is about empowering data protection. Is that right? Uh, for yes. Against it. Yeah. But um, post-privacy isn't against data protection. Post-privacy is saying that data protection just doesn't work the way we talk about it. So um, there is this uh, a term of uh, loss of control uh, so that you, um, that's what, what I talked about earlier, that you, um, even if you think you behave like protecting yourself, you don't really know what you're doing and what, what, what was just shown that even um, metadata is enough for um, uh, knowing things about you, for breaking encryption and, and so on. So no, it's not against data protection, but what, what we don't like are some people maybe that are quite, quite um, uh, enthusiastic about uh, uh, data protection, um, but we are more about 
warning about uh, fighting for data protection instead of fighting for um, changes that might be uh, changes in laws, what we just dis discussed. So I'm more interested in, in talking let, let's go back to, uh, to the health insurance system uh, about uh, talking that all people should have access to uh, specific pricings regard, uh, regardless how they are, in which condition they are, um, so that they are not afraid of the health insurance company knowing that they are, I don't know, too old, too fat or something like that, because they will know if they want to. So um, everything leaves traces and it's really hard to control. Um, but uh, so I wouldn't agree on on saying that we uh, have to fight for um, a law that regulates if people are able to analyze data because the data is there, but it shouldn't affect you in a negative way. And I think that's the goal that I'm fighting for. Yeah. Okay, passing on to Marina. Okay, quick answer because this is a complicated question. I, I'm not saying right now we should get rid of states. Um, I, I'm stating the fact that states have no power over the internet and over information. We see that um, in the German debate, uh, things came up like you should use um, German mail on German mail servers, and we're we're not letting mail uh, cross the border, but we keep it inside the German border, so we have control over it, which is ridiculous because it's never going to work. So uh, if you talk about control over the internet, you just can't um, ask the states. It's unrealistic. I disagree with you there slightly because I think that there is a question of state control. I mean, 80% of search engines are, you know, on US yeah. soil. So there is, a, there is a kind of sort of colonialism of the internet right now. There is an empire and, the, and America is the empire. And we can create clouds and we can create infrastructures that are you know, specific to countries. And I'm not saying that that ghettoization of the internet is necessarily the way forward, but it, it is possible. So I just wanted to say that it is possible. Sorry to interrupt your point. Hi. Um, I have a very short uh, note and a short question. Uh, first, the note, I think the um, uh, privacy is not only, is not only about what is actually the, the, the current status, but also what should be. It's a normative term, which means it, it puts me into control whether I should, uh, can publish something or not. And so in this context, um, post-privacy is not quite clear to me. Um, but anyway, uh, the question would be, I, I heard the term that we are currently living in a global world with one secret government, uh, which is uh, the conglomerate of secret services. Um, and I found this funny and uh, then I thought about it a little bit and I would like to hear your thoughts on this because uh, governments change but the secret service people usually stay the same. So are you asking us if we believe in conspiracy theories? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, but you said again, do, 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 we, do, do I believe there's one single? Well, what, what I would, sorry, what I would, what I picked up from your point is, is one thought, which is that what was very interesting for me in the UK response on this issue was how many government ministers, former and present, said they did not know what was happening. Even ones who were right in the inner circle of making decisions, of being on the security um, committee, said, I didn't know this had gone this far. And that for me is a very, very frightening um, state of affairs when the government says, oh, you know, we don't know because then who is responsible? And yet just how wide are these surveillance agencies? And it's true, it's very quickly the imagination is able to go into this paranoid zone of, you know, oh my God, they're controlling all of us. I don't, I, maybe I just don't want to, but I don't believe that is the case. But I think there's definitely uh, an issue here about uh, just how far accountability goes. Okay, so I, I just want to comment about what Marina said about a centralized control of the internet infrastructure. And uh, it's not the first time this is being mentioned because I do participate in what, uh, on internet governance issues. And this, they are very contentious because currently, the current internet has grown the way it is because it's been very decentralized. Any person who has a computer and can just connect to the network is part of the internet. And I think this is something that should not be compromised. We should have a very open internet where anybody can participate. But the key has been that certain parts of the co-internet infrastructure 
such as the domain name service, has been exclusively under American control. And uh, there's an institution that deals with that. It's called ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. And if the best thing, I think, is not to centralize that, but to actually get more users to actually decentralize the role of maybe ICANN, such that any part of the world of international, there's actually international participation from people. And this is one of the things why I feel a centralized control of the internet under the UN or any institution can be detrimental because if you look at the ITU, for example, they are the ones who make the standards. It is closed. It's only a participatory by governments. And therefore, you yourself cannot actually change what the ITU says. We don't want that kind of thing. We want something different. And then also just a comment on Priya's. Uh, you mentioned the Internet uh, Bill of Rights or an equivalent. Even when you're making such or crafting maybe such a bill, you should also have a multi-stakeholder approach to it, not just governments dealing with it. So users should actually be able to out give their views and even participate in the process. That's all I have to say. Um, please don't get me wrong. Um, what I'm talking about when I say centralized is just the rules we should behave, because rules are always centralized. People have to agree on them. Um, however, when it comes to hardware and software, I strongly believe in decentralized systems. So I completely agree with you. Um, and I just right now figured out how the state uh, governments can actually help in the process. For example, I, um, I hardly ever encrypt my email because my partners never do. And uh, that has to do with, um, you know, it, it's just really hard. It's, you need a pretty high knowledge about how things work to encrypt your email. We have about no simple tools to do that. And I think the government should support open software projects that encrypt email, that have a nice user interface that are easy to use. That's a way to help. Would you like so, to um, Priya, thank you for your description of the of the environment that we're existing in. This sort of he, she, it. Um, what concerns me in, in in my analysis, or what I try to articulate, is how how the it and the machines are shaping us as individuals and culture. And uh, um, you you brought up an example of totalitarianism and saying something like the three ways out of that are the um, uh, going deep inside, hiding from the totalitarian regime. Uh, the, the second was uh, um, resistance. resistance, and the third was exile. And then you rejected, at the end, exile as a solution. And I'm not saying it's going to be an easy thing to imagine how we go into exile from, from a kind of technological regime, but I don't think it's, it's not unimaginable. And I think it's important to, to look at that as, as a possibility. What would exile from the technological regime look like, look like, as opposed to trying to roll back something which, in my mind, we've experienced a, a data Chernobyl. Um, it, it is something, it is a kind of technology that we do need in some way to step back from. And um, I think, just to add to that, I think the post-privacy thing has been incredibly discredited because we live in a very predatory, corporate, almost techno-fascist environment. So you can't really consider that utopia in such a dangerous environment. Yeah, no, I, I really like what you said. Um, thank you very much for expressing it so well. Um, I, you know, f when you give a keynote like this, you want to take also a slightly provocative line, so you have to sort of let go of other possibilities. But I, I think keeping on imagining other ways of living are absolutely essential for any kind of thriving um, society and of course we need to keep other visions of, of being um, and we do that through literature and um, you know through, through, through any way that we can so I, I agree with you there yeah. uh, hi uh, a lot has been said about uh, giving us choice and Priya you said about uh, regulating the companies on the global level I cannot agree more it would be great to have that regulation but we have to keep in mind one major obstacle which is their business model uh, it's now based on the premise that it's our choice to go to certain companies and even if you have a perfect regulation preventing them from abusing your data or taking more data you can still agree to give more data and people do this because they want services for free 
the companies in response to our criticism, they say, we are, there is no demand for alternative business model to this one. Like when we say, just give us a choice, give us a choice whether we pay with real money or, well, the opposite, whether we pay with currencies or we pay with the real money, which is our data. Uh, and they say, no, we will not do this because it's minority of the minority of the minority that wants to pay with uh, old fashioned currencies. So basically what we have to do is to interfere with these business models. And we cannot do that uh, as long as we don't prove that they are monopolies. Uh, we cannot do this because they can still say, oh, you can go to Tor, you can do go to your open source you know, thingies. Nobody forces you to use Facebook and Google. So we really, it, it's a trap and we are all caught in the trap because the minor, majority of people still go to these big services and still agree they actually actively choose uh, paying with data instead of paying with uh, old currencies. So I just wanted to bring up that issue and maybe hear your comments how to deal with that. Yeah, no, that's a very interesting and good point. Um, I hope that there will be some entrepreneurs who come up with um, a really interesting and um, attractive platform, which we maybe do have to pay for, and that people will start to gravitate towards. Um, what uh, troubled me a little bit when one of the early discussions um, on the panel with the panelists from different countries was when we were talking about India and um, the panelists said that when the companies come in to talk about privacy, they really emphasize to them, but you have to do this because then you'll get customers. This is what you do to get customers. You promise them privacy, even if it's just an illusion of privacy, because then you get customers. And I'm sure she doesn't want just an illusion of privacy. I know she's fighting, she's fighting hard on that. But that th this is the approach at all to me was really disturbing that you say to the Companies, you have to do it to get, cus to get customers. Why don't you turn it around? I mean, they are customers too. I mean, these should be ethical discussions, not just business discussions. Absolutely. Two more questions left in. Um, thanks very much for your panel, and I enjoyed your, your opening speech. Um, I wanted to, I, I guess I wanted to make a comment, which is that, uh, you know, GCHQ is funded by the NSA and the Five Eyes program, it, it, it's not a conspiracy, right? And the reporting we've done in Der Spiegel, what we've shown is that it's a plan and it's an agreement. And I don't think that it's helpful to dismiss that as paranoia. In fact, if we look, there are secret agencies that are outside of the rule of law and they regularly partner with each other and they give up data that if Snowden had released it to the world, he, he would be in even more trouble, let's say. Um, but. My question is, um, first to Marina, I guess, and then to you. Um, if you see that your approach, if you were to compare it to traditional Marxist-Leninism, if you were to look at it, are you advocating essentially for a top-down uh, system in any way, or are you approaching it more like a Bakunin anarchistic approach with mesh networks where you have individualized uh, security and you have some coordination between individual uh, uh, players that's my question to you, and my question to you is, why wouldn't you download a car? <laughs> is that the working one? Yes. Yeah. So, um, if you ask me between those two, I think I'm more on Bakunin's side. Um, so, I, I'd rather organize um, bottom-up, and I think that's the only way to really, really grant freedom, is decentral, bottom-up organization, and we have the means, you know. if if. Every person would um, own just their part of the network. Um, you know, th th there wouldn't be a server or a central line um, that could be tapped. Uh, one network that works with this premise is Diaspora, uh, which we refuse to use um, instead of Facebook because nobody's there. But that's exactly the kind of de decentral network I would um, I would uh, agree to use. Well, I mean, I think the question is always what, um, what, when you make a choice like that about what to download, what to get for free, what do you give in return? And um, I think if you're aware of the choice and you think it's a reasonable price to pay with um, the fact that maybe when I go around in this car, they'll be able to follow me wherever I go because it is free. Um, if I was happy to pay with that. Is, sorry, is that, was that a question? You're looking a bit confused. <laughs> ah, okay. Yes.
N no, that, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a different point to the point I was making. I mean, you're suggesting that, um, I mean, of course, making something local if you can is, 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 is absolutely better than, but, but what, what I'm talking about is the fact that we download um, copyrighted artistic material without thinking there's anything wrong with that. And to me, I mean, that, that is, I mean, I'm a writer, I live from my work, and um, I'm really happy that you all read about my books. There are many articles out there that I've written that could be read just as they are, but I would totally not subscribe to saying, yes, everything should be downloadable, and everybody should have access to everything for free. Sorry? It's 70 years, isn't it, as far as I know, for authors? Yeah, but, but we're going to but agree guys, to disagree on this one in the proper British way. Yeah, the copyright law is another conference next week. Okay. <laughs> my, yeah, we have a final question over my there. My question goes and mainly. Of course, yeah. My question go, uh, goes probably mainly to uh, Priya. I'm very grateful for you mentioning the need for an international bill of digital rights in your terrific keynote. Um, could a court for, for, for those uh, rights be maybe in The Hague, um, in the midst of the EU, which had, uh, from my point of view, uh, kind of an, nearly had an inner breakdown when they stood it up against uh, uh, the, the, the state of, of surveillance. Um, this would put, uh, of course, mutual restrictions to states in the case of the states versus the public. But on the other hand, would you put hope in, in more state-like processes from the United Nations, maybe the International Postal Union or uh, extension of the, the ICANN um, to, um, to control the, the surveillance of companies? Uh, um, and I want to mention, secondly, the, the tragic and dramatic uh, uh, downfall of, of the common sense in giving up basic rights for free services, which uh, I insist doesn't have a parallel in the real world. I mean, if you uh, receive a printed advertisement in your mailbox and put it to your apartment, you wouldn't allow uh, someone to get secretly a, a second key and to, to invade your apartment and take a sheet of the same size or uh, the same value uh, away uh, for payment uh, um, afterwards. So, um, those two. Yeah, Clemens should. Okay, this is a good guessing game. Um, just a short uh, remark um, uh, regarding um, Maria's uh, talk about uh, diaspora. There has been this diaspora, um, actually you can say there has been. Um, I, I don't know if you, if you know what it is. It, is a, it, it was an approach building a distributed um, kind of secure social network. Um, the thing about diaspora is what it showed that it won't work, and not this diaspora, actually the approach doesn't work, because diaspora is not a network, it's kind of an anti-network. Um, the thing that gets on everybody's nerves, uh, nerves on Twitter and Facebook is that it always su suggests you friends, and do, do you know this guy, and, and this girl, and stuff like that. Um, but what works there is that you find people. So when you go to a, to a service that doesn't collect data in order to let you find people, you have very high, high cost at building a network because you have to exchange uh, uh, um, business cards or set up a personal web page, how to find you. So it costs you a lot of time and even money to find other people and that is why it won't work. And that is why Diaspora didn't work. And the founders of Diaspora actually did a crowdfunding and what they built afterwards is a, is a meme generator uh, with Facebook integration, so. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I think, ah. Would you like to comment? No, I don't. Okay, then, uh, before Geraldine uh, will give us all the information in regard to how we proceed, uh, what we do in the next four hours, I just want to thank you very much, all panelists on this panel, Priya, Marina, and Clemens, for being here. Thank you. I take it that the real issue is taking responsibility, and that's what I'm taking home. Thank you very much, Christian, and of course, thank you for me to the three of you as well. Um, and thanks to all of you uh, who have been, you, you've all been so attentive and 
um, sitting and listening and also engaging in questions throughout the morning. Um, that's a great compliment to us up here. Thank you. Uh, we're now ready to break for lunch. We're slightly behind schedule, but if at all possible, I would kindly ask you to make it back here by two o'clock. And back here, I mean actually up here, because we will be starting with our after lunch sessions on time around two o'clock. Um, so lunch won't be served here, but the Schlesische Straße is full of wonderful small places for you to go and venture out, catch a bit of fresh air and get a bit of movement. And um, yes, grab some food and return back here, please, in the next 40 minutes if possible. We have a promise a lot of highlights prepared in the afternoon, so we look forward to seeing you back here then. Thank you. <laughs>